Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask you to bless our time looking at what you have prepared to sustain us in this life. Lord, help us to realize how blessed it is to know that you've always wanted to sit down with your people and have a feast. Lord, and thank you for giving us a feast in this life. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we get to this part, and I had to use a lot of this, what you're going to hear today in my last doctoral paper. Um, that class was on what's important in worship and worship theory from a theological viewpoint. And my professor said the most important thing in the service is the sermon, and everything else should be important, but the sermon is the most important. I chose to prove him differently in my papers. Um, traditional Lutheran theology says that there are two peaks, two high points of every service. One is the reading of the gospel and the sermon. The other one is the Lord's Supper. But I sort of put it this way. Kevin, which would you rather do? Read a book about Susan's life or be with her? Be with her. The sermon and the word of God being read is about reading a book about her life and understanding who she is and how she grew up in St. Louis and Fort Wayne and all over the place. But communion is being with someone. And that's why I think it's a little bit different. And my professor is slowly coming around to that point of view. Um, as we say in the introduction to the entire ser ser yeah, series, quoting from the Book of Concord, it says, our people have been unjustly accused of having abolished the Mass. And we've talked about the Mass just means the gathering of God's people. But it is obvious without boasting that the Mass is celebrated among us with greater devotion and earnestness than among our opponents. The people are instructed more regularly and with the greatest diligence concerning the Holy Sacrament to what it was purpose it was instituted and how it's to be used, namely as a comfort to terrified conscience. Because if you realize how much you sin and you realize you're in the presence of God, you should be slightly terrified. Bob, let's say one day you fell over and you landed against Nancy's curio cabinet and half the stuff fell out and shattered. I mean, Nancy's mad at you just thinking about the possibility of it. <laughs> <laughs> how terrified would you be when she got home from pl pr playing Trivial Pursuit with friends <laughs> but I mean you'd be terrified and if we realized that God was we were in the presence of God when we were sitting we should be appropriately terrified by the way I will give a caveat to this if you were talking about the Lutheran Church 500 years ago, yes, there was a lot more attention spent on teaching people about the value of the Lord's Supper and about the entire service. My goal is to do it once every three years. But there are churches that you never hear of this. And people forget why we do what we do. And if you don't know why we do what we do, it gets kind of boring and dry. You go, why do we have to walk up here and kneel down again? Or one member, uh, Don Harrell, used to say, but if we don't have communion, we get out of church 15, 20 minutes earlier, and I can get to a baseball game that much faster. And then he had a class on worship as a deacon, and his mind was changed a little because he started to realize how important this was and how special it was. And now that they're in Texas, one of the complaints is, we don't have communion every week. Job done. Because all of us, if we think about it, should be appropriately worried when we consider what we've not done right. The next slide, I forget I have the remote up here. Yep. A well-prepared feast. This is another quote from Martin Luther in a sermon about the Lord's Supper. And I love them. In these words, the soul finds a well-prepared table 
at which it satisfies all hunger. For it knows for a certainty that he who speaks, that being Jesus, cannot lie. Therefore, the soul falls upon the word and clings to it and trusts in it, and also builds its dwelling place in the strength of this well-prepared table. This is the feast for which the Heavenly Father slayed his oxen and fatlings and invited us all to it. The sacrifice is so incredible. And it's not really the, the sacrifice is Jesus, not oxen. Imagine if we had to sacrifice an ox or a goat or a pigeon for every sin Kevin committed this week. I thought you were going to say we all offer up cats instead. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Kevin jokes about hating cats, but we all know he loves them. But this idea of the feast, of the Lord's Supper, is something where we should come here and be so comforted and find so much peace and find so much hope and find so much healing. That's why we should treasure it, not just because it's what Lutherans, good Lutherans do every Sunday. We treasure it because of what it gives us. And so part of the assignment I had to do was find backup for my theological point about worship throughout all of Scripture. So I found eight passages in the Old Testament and two in the New Testament, which we're going to go through the next this week and next. The first is, the, first, the feast was originally delayed. Uh, there should be a handout somewhere, Joy. I don't know where it is. Do we have any more? Okay. So we are on slide four. It says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I was afraid. I, so, I, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. And so God was going to have time with them, to have a special time. You know, Kevin, if Susan made a chocolate cake and you had done something really bad and you had to hide and you couldn't have the chocolate cake, how upset would Susan be? Depends on what you did. Which is worse, what you did or missing out on the fact of her chocolate cake? <laughs> Depends on what she did. But if she was looking forward to having that time with you, she probably would have forgiven you for whatever you did. But the idea was God was out there looking for them to spend time with them. And they were hiding because they were afraid. And the feast should be one of those things that we should be drawn to to overcome that fear. God loves to spend time with his people. That's why he created us. And he created the world for us, but he created us to have time with him. And so that's an incredible blessing that we have to know and how to deal with. And so the feast that was supposed to happen in the garden was delayed. If we go on to the next slide. Uh, this is when Moses goes to Egypt. And he says to Pharaoh, well, we'll hear it. At this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses, after this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Well, that word festival is also the word feast. And what kind of festival it is? To keep a festival from the idea of leaping and dancing in sacred dances and further to reel and to be giddy. It's used of drunkards. So this isn't a well-behaved, proper English feast. You know, how do you drink tea with your pointy, pinky finger out? Yeah. This isn't that kind of thing. This is a pate. This is an Italian wedding reception. And the guy who's dancing around, which is one of the passages we'll get to later, is God, because he's so happy that everyone's there. 
And so the original idea for Israel to leave Egypt was to be able to throw this kind of feast. To have this kind of festival. And that's important. We need to see this pattern throughout Scripture of God wanting to sit down with his people and have a party with them. You know, I think some people think God is this very proper British father figure. He has a sense of humor. He loves to have fun with his people. He loves to dance, oddly enough. It's only used of him 34 times in the Old Testament. When his people come home, he dances. We usually translate that celebrate so we don't. Or he has joy. You know? And this feast that he wants to throw for us, that he will throw when we're in heaven, is pictured throughout Scripture. And the New Testament proper example of it is the Lord's Supper. And so, of course, the Pharaoh said, no, I won't let them go. And then they had a battle back and forth and ten plagues and all that kind of stuff. And when Moses gets all the people to Mount Sinai, they have something called Passover. Well, they had a feast when they were given permission to leave. Then they had a bigger feast when they get to Mount Sinai. Both of those feasts are where we get the Lord's Supper from. And it's a picture of Passover. And Passover is a picture of the Lord's Supper. And both of those feasts were incredibly fun feasts. They weren't very proper or very reserved or very, you know, more Irish than English, I guess would be a way to phrase it, or more Irish than German. I've never been to a German party. Are there any fun? Yeah? Oktoberfest? Well, that's when everyone's drunk, I think. No. (laughs) How else do you eat sauerkraut? (laughs) Sorry, somebody might like that. In regards to that feast, the next slide is the New Testament version of it. Remember this, then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this, these people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. See, that's where we get church at nine. Know what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. So even Pentecost was slightly rowdy. People were happy. The Holy Spirit was with them. They knew that God loved them. Kevin, when Susan said yes, did you go, Okay, thank you. Or did you smile and pass out and start calling everybody? There was lots of happiness. That's the same concept here. There's lots of happiness. There's lots of joy. There's lots of exuberance. And even at the rail. Even when we're taking communion, there can be that happiness. And so, Old Testament says it's a party. New Testament says it's a party. Next slide, number seven. The covenant feast. This was one of those I pointed out to my professor, and he goes, I never saw that being communion, but you can't argue it. It is. This is after the Ten Commandments are given. So the covenant's there. It says, Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel climbed up the mountain again. There they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue lapis lazuli, as clear as the sky itself. And although these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy them. In fact, they ate a covenant meal, eating and drinking in his presence. In the Hebrew is actually they drank wine. So they're having, the Ten Commandments are given. The people of God say, yes, we are in covenant with you. And God takes the leaders as representatives of the whole. 
up into the sky. I mean, what else would be that blue underneath you, you know? And they have a meal together. Again, this feast keeps coming through over and over and over again. And, and that's part of it. You know, it's, the elders weren't, it, they did not get destroyed. Remember, Moses wasn't allowed to see God face to face, for if he did, he would have been destroyed. Holy ground. He. If I was in the presence of God, my entire body would turn white. And I'd, you know, I'm going to pass out. You know? And, and yet, these guys went up and had a party with God. And they were welcomed in his presence. That's what this is all about. That's where we need to realize what church is. I remember growing up being somewhat Catholic. And if we made a sound in church and the nun was there, out came the 18-inch ruler with the steel or brass or bronze or whatever the heck it was edge to it. And whap! Be respectful to God. Would they still do that today? Probably not. There would be lawsuits. I understand Lutheran teachers did the same thing once upon a time. Although I can't see your dad or mom doing it. Your dad knows how to deal. Dad knew how to deal gently with people. I think. Your mom might have been a little bit. Who was more mean, your mom or your dad? Who was meaner when it came to discipline? Your mom. I, but I mean, there's a point where is God going to discipline us when we need to be disciplined? Of course. But is His goal to be the God that is always looking over us? trying to figure out what Joy is going to do next so that he can give her a swat? No. Joy does something wrong, God wants to go, let me take care of it, and he gives her a big hug. That's the kind of God we have. And the celebration is the end result of it. The wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation is one of the most powerful scenes, and we'll get to it, that's the last passage in this series, that there is. And communion is the closest thing we get to it until we're in heaven. Anyone ever been to an Italian wedding reception? My family, they lasted three days. The bride and groom were there for about four hours. And then no one ever noticed they were gone because the party was too good. Now this is going to be a party in heaven where Christ and his bride, the church, We'll be partying for eternity because we're in his presence. Kevin's going, eventually we'll throw our wedding reception. <laughs> huh? It'll happen. Getting closer. That's what church should be about. It should be a happy place. And while we want to be reverent, we don't want to be stoic. And there's a big difference. I was trying to explain that to my 14-year-old. If you saw me preaching 25 years ago, I stood there at this massive pulpit and I put my hands in my pocket or I twiddled with my ring and I spoke in a monotone for 45 minutes. Because that's how good proper preachers did it. Yeah, they've stayed more awake than the people here do. <laughs> hey, there were only five people asleep today. <laughs> and only two were snoring. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Bob you just knocked over her case of curios 
But I mean, you look at these passages and there's such joy in the presence of God. And there should be such joy in the church if the church is the presence of God. All of that's all the stuff that stresses you out. The more you know about God, the more you, closer you come to the altar, the more you should leave all the stress behind. And that's why anyone know anyone else in life who's dealing with stress right now? Does anyone know anyone who's not dealing with stress right now? And this is a place where they can be reminded how much God loves them and how much he cares for them and what's going on. And that's essential for us. Let's see, we're just at slide seven, slide eight. I will walk among you. I will be your God and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you'll no longer be slaves. I broke the yoke of slavery around your neck so you can walk with your heads held high. That's from Leviticus. And from the Augsburg Confession about it, it says this, in the third place, the holy sacrament was not instituted to provide a sacrifice for sin. The sacrifice has already occurred. But it's to awaken our faith and comfort our consciences. The sacrament makes them, that's us, aware that they are promised grace and the forgiveness of sin by Christ. This is why the sacrament requires faith, and without faith, it's used in vain. We have to trust God and his promise. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. Another one of your translations, another one of the translations says, uh, Luke, I think it's all sin. Is that something to celebrate? Let's say you have a loan out on your house and some credit card bills and a car loan and you're a hundred to five hundred thousand dollars in debt. What would happen if someone came over like Tom and he wrote a check and paid off everything you owe, everything your kids owe? Huh? Let's find out. I was <laughs> 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 but I mean, if someone canceled all of your debt, would you be, gee, thank you? Yeah. Well, which is, wor which is more, your debt to banks and other agencies, or your debt to God for all of your sin? Huh? You don't have to, it already was. And this is the celebration. Huh? <laughs> you keep on racking up the bills. Yeah. But this is the celebration that's the predecessor to the big celebration that it's all taken care of. And so, yes, we should be aware that we're in the presence of God, but it's still a joy. It's still a joy to hear it. In my paper, that, about this point, was I said, no wonder people were so happy to go to the temple three times a year because that was when they were reminded and the only time they were reminded that God forgave their sin. And every seventh year, not only all their sin, but all their debt. We should go back to that idea. Let's see, I owe me seven times my debt should have been forgiven. Eight times should, all my debt should have been forgiven in life. That's a lot of money. But we look at this and it's got to be a celebration. This should be a point that's a lot better than listening to me preach. And I'm honest about that. Even if I was the best preacher in the world, or the best preacher in Cerritos, or the best preacher here. Celebrating God's love for his people with him is a critical, important part that should happen often. But the problem is, is we're trained about how to behave properly in it far more than we're trained about what it is. We have the small catechism for kids. We have the large catechism for adults. We have adult membership classes. We have all of this stuff. And most of them are to make sure you have the common basic knowledge. Now people want... I've had people ask me, Pastor, exactly how should I hold my hands when I take communion? 
It, yeah, no, but there are, there are books out there that will tell you how you should properly kneel, how you should properly hold your hands, and they never tell you about the fact that you should celebrate this. And I understand that because people get too excessive. If people, you know, we had one person here, she will remain nameless, but one year at our Monday Thursday service where we celebrate the Last Supper in the middle of a meal like it was at the Passover, someone came over and put one of the little silver chalices we use once a year in front of her, and that person goes, oh, that's so incredible, can I have two? Yes, you do. <laughs> Troublemaker. <laughs> and, and part of me wanted to laugh because should we want double of everything God gives us? Of course. If you only choose the wine, then... <laughs> but there were times in history where people got drunk at the Lord's Supper. Because they all shared out of one goblet. And you have this big old goblet and someone comes over and drinks half of it. They're staggering back to their chair. But because of excesses, we, we locked it down and made it very rigid. And I had someone say, Pastor, I uh, remember Hugh, um, before he passed away, he had his leg amputated. And he goes, I have to kneel at the altar. Hugh, you only have one leg. I'll make it work. If you feel like you have to, but you don't have to. And it was harder for him to kneel with his artificial leg, so he'd take it off, and then he'd come forward. <laughs> and he'd, with his cane, and then he'd kneel down. He wanted to, that's one thing. But if some pastor says, unless you kneel down, I'm not communing you. No. Oh. Some people knelt down today. Some people didn't. Does it really matter? No. For some people it matters in your hearts and you do what your hearts say. Some people put their right hand. Some people put their left hand out. Some people put both hands out. You know the only thing I don't like? There's some people, not in this congregation, but they would put their hands down. And so if you're kneeling here and your hand's six inches lower than that, what does the pastor have to do to put the body of Christ in your hand? Oh, oh, oh my back. Another congregation I've been to does that, and you end up with a severe backache after the third service. But this is a celebration. Chris, in his training to become a deacon eventually, has helped out on a couple of Wednesday nights. And he said that he can't look into your eyes because he goes, there's so much love for God there, he just gets overwhelmed and he forgets where he's at. That's proper. That's the way it should be. And I was talking with Carla's husband. And he grew up in the Catholic Church and Carla was like, well, if we, when we're in town and we come to church here, can he take communion? I said, let's talk about it. So in the rehearsal, we're talking about this. And I go, three questions. One, do you believe everything in the creed? Yeah. Two, do you know what it is up on the altar? He goes, it's the body and blood of Christ. It's good so far. Number three, why do you, need, why do you want to take it? Because I'm a good person. Eh. And he finally realized, because I need it. And if you remember the old Groucho Marx television show when someone said the magic word and all the paper came down, it goes a party, that's the magic word. We take the Lord's Supper because we need it. We need to know that he's with us. We need to know that he loves us. It's not something we get to take because we're good enough. If Tom had to be good enough to take communion, I get struck at the altar because I'd give it to him anyways with lightning. We'd both get fried. Or Bob would like the barbecue grill, one or the other. <laughs> what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, if you start juggling it, yeah, that might be it. But it's that concern and that care for it that makes the difference. If you're just like, eh, here, 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 here. That's not the same. And if you didn't do it with a serious attitude, I'd probably say something to you. Because I have no problem saying something to you. But that's part of it. You want guys up here who will take it seriously. This is a gift of God for the people of God, and you're just the waiter. I'm just the waiter. Or the wait staff, or whatever they call them. You serve, serve, no, they can't use servers anymore. There's a new name for waiters and waitresses. I forgot what it is. Ser no, they can't use server anymore. Can't use servant. It's too close to servant. That, so they outlawed that one. Huh? I have no idea. I mean, half the restaurants don't serve you anymore anyways. So. But God will walk among us. He'll be our God and we will be his people. And that's what this is a celebration of. Next slide. Oh, I went through this one fast. This is a quote from my paper. The sermon and the entire worship service teach and help the church consciously experience God's love as they gather around the altar. It's here that the church has a foretaste of the feast to come. It's not that the knowledge even given qualifies a person to partake in the Lord's Supper. It helps them realize what's going on in the feast. Remember that first quote? We continually teach people so they know what's going on. Because it is easy to get into a pattern of behavior and not think about what you're doing. Anyone ever wash dishes with someone else and you know you, you wash and then you hand it for them to wipe and you wash and hand it for your wife and you get done with the dishes and they're waiting for the next plate to be wiped. Oh, that, that was the old days before washing machine, dishwashers. Growing up I had to wash dishes with my brother and he'd be, give me the next plate, we're done. You know, because he unconsciously got in the pattern of moving. That's the one thing that continually re going over this knowledge helps. That's what makes it meaningful. That's what helps us to be aware that we dwell in the presence of God in the midst of it. And that's important. You know, whether we're outside walking in a line or whether we get to come up to the rail, which I have missed so much, and I'm so glad we get to do now. Because it takes out, you have to move, you have to change your thought, you have to get a chance to kneel down or stand there and think about what's about to happen. And that's a blessing that everyone should have. You know, our new um, Agnus Day. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come to me. Still, you are welcome here. Jesus says that to all of us. We may have had a bad week. We may have had a bad morning. We may have struggled here, there, and everywhere along the way. But still, you're welcome here. Tom, you may have had the worst week since you left Caltrans. And yet God still wants you here. He still wants you being an elder. Same thing, Bob. Doug. And you may have had a fight on the way to church. You may have had a fight in church. You, know? you may have heard something that just irritated the living daylights out of you. And God says, let me take care of it. You're welcome here. And you come and you kneel down, and I, I still remember this. When Kay and I started at, as Lutherans 20, yeah, 20 years ago this September, and I watched people, and I, was, I went from being a non-denom pastor to a Lutheran vicar in one week, and I had to switch back afterwards because I had to go preach. The, my old church made me stay for another month. 
And I watched people come to the rail. And they were like this. And they were stressed out by the week, which living in Yucca Valley happens. It's not a very fun place to live in most of the time. Although Matt likes it. And they would kneel down at the altar rail. And Pastor Hendry and Bob, the elder, I can't remember Rob, Bob's name, last name. But they, and they, they let me be the acolyte my first week. And I watched people's bodies relax. And I watched all the stress just wipe off their bodies. And they, where they walked over, and hunched over, and they looked down, and they didn't smile when they came up to communion. When they left the communion rail and got up, stood tall, they had a big old smile on their face, and they rejoiced. Why? Because they knew God loved them. Because they knew God was merciful. Because they understood this all. And that's why I say, you know, I, I mentioned, Kevin, which do you, would you rather do? Read a book about Susan or spend the afternoon with her walking along the beach? And you said reading the book. <laughs> oh, so you're gonna give away one of Susan's cats. <laughs> now she's really gonna be mad at you, and the only thing you'll get is the book. <laughs> Kevin? I'll let it be Susan's choice. Okay. By the way, there are five more on the way. <laughs> but which is more important? We, we need to know about God. There's no doubt. We need to be corrected in what we understand about him. But we need time with him too. And that's what the Lord's Supper is all about. That's why it's so precious. That's why we want to make sure people know what it is. And if that's true, if we're rejoicing in it, then life changes. If only for the half an hour until we get to wherever we're going next. But hopefully we'll remember what happened here. And it'll get us through to the next week. Or to Wednesday night. This is a time to celebrate and be aware of one simple fact. The Lord is with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is a tremendous gift you give us in the body and blood of Christ. Lord, it connects us to the cross where we find our salvation in his sacrifice. It is obedience to you to make you a people that are yours. Lord, help us celebrate this. Help us rejoice. Help us to make people aware of how welcome they are at this feast. And Lord, help us to know it. Lord, bring more people to your altar here to your churches throughout the world. Lord, help us to teach well why this is so special. And help us to rejoice. We pray this all in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome week. And we'll be here Wednesday night.